So in recent days, we heard the scandal of an NFL broadcast sideline reporter making up uh, bits of trivia, you know, to throw twos at the, uh, the side of the field. Yeah, like I said, it was pretty bad, but not as bad as this. Today, we're going to be talking about the winner of a Pulitzer who got it because she lied. Now, Janet Cook's scandal, uh, uh, she was a journalist for a number of years between 77 and 81 before the scandal broke. She received a Pulitzer Prize in 81 for an article written for the Washington Post. The story was later discovered to have been fabricated, <clears throat> and Cook returned to Pulitzer, the only person to do so to date, after admitting she had fabricated the story series. The Pulitzer was instead awarded to Teresa Carpenter, a nominee who had lost to Cook. Now, Cook grew up in an upper-middle-class African-American family in Toledo. She said her upbringing was stressful and strict, with constant pressure placed on her by both the predominantly white prep school she attended and by her father, whom she described as domineering. As a result, she said that habitually lying became a survival mechanism for her as a child. She enrolled at Vassar before transferring to the University of Toledo, where she earned a bachelor's degree. However, Cook would later claim that she received her bachelor's degree from Vassar and a master's degree from Toledo. Now, in 77, she began writing for the Toledo Blade. Two years later, she interviewed for a position at the Washington Post and was hired. She joined a weekly section staff at the Post under editor Vivian Alfin Brown Lee in January 1980. She there, she quickly gained a reputation as a prolific journalist and a strong writer, filing 52 articles in her first eight months. Alfin uh, Brown Lee later remarked that Cook was also consumed by a blind and raw ambition. So, uh, in journalism, sometimes that's where you get these. Up and comers will want to approve it, and the problem is where the reporter is left to do the job of the editor, like background information, that there's a problem. Now, in a September 2880 article in the Post titled Jimmy's World, Cook profiles the supposed life of an eight year old heroin addict named Jimmy, said to be a pseudonym. She wrote of the needle marks freckling the baby smooth skin of his thin brown arms and claimed to have witnessed episodes of heroin injection, describing them in graphic detail. The article in, engendered much empathy amongst readers, including Marion Barry, then Mayor of Washington. Now, he and other city officials organized an all-out police search for the boy, which was unsuccessful and led to speculation that the story was not true. Barry, under considerable public pressure, announced a resolution, variously said that Jimmy had been entered into treatment or had died. Barry then admitted that the city still had no information on the youth's whereabouts and suggested that the story was partially fictionalized, saying it was unlikely that Jimmy's mother or dealer would allow a reporter to see them shoot up as Cook claimed she saw. Although some within the Post doubted the story, the paper defended it and assisting manager editor Bob Woodward submitted the story for the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing, which Cook was awarded on April 13, 81. An AP article of the Pulitzer winners featured biographical profiles, including Cook's fabricated educational background. When the article was seen by editors at the Toledo Blade, they noticed the discrepancies and alerted the AP, who, which in turn contacted the Post. A further review of Cook's self-reported biography revealed additional fabrications that she had been added since been fired at the Post, hired at the Post. Her initial resume claimed she was fluent in French and Spanish, but she later added Portuguese and Italian. Uh, executive editor Ben Bradley later tested her language abilities and found she spoke no Portuguese or Italian and only rudimentary French. In addition, she also had a claim that she attended the University of Paris and won seven awards for a journalist in Ohio, as opposed to the one she had previously listed. Now, on April 14th, Cook was co confronted about these discrepancies by Post editors and admitted to fabricating her background. Editors then reviewed her notes and recorded interviews for the story and found no evidence she had ever interviewed a child who was using heroin. When Cook initially stood by her reporting, she began to equivocate over the following hours before finally admitting that Jimmy was fabricated. On the morning of April 15th, Cook issues a statement in which she publicly confessed this and announced her resignation from the Post. The, the Post served for feature writing was then instead given to Teresa Carpenter for her poignant article in the Village Voice about the murder of former Playboy model and Canadian uh, actress Doherty Strat. Of Jimmy's world, Woodward said, I believed it. We published it. Official questions had been raised, but we stood by the story at her. Internal questions had been raised, but none about her work. The reports were about the story not sounding right, being based on anonymous sources, and primarily about purported lies about her personal life. 
told by three reporters, two she had dated, and one who fell in close competition with her. I think that the decision to nominate the story for a Pulitzer is of minimal consequence. I also think that a one is of little consequence. It is a brilliant story, fake and fraud that it is. It would be absurd for me and any other editor to review the authenticity or accuracy of stories that are nominated for prizes. Now, uh, a kind of a recap of this was in a very important WKRP in Cincinnati uh, episode where Bailey made up fab- fabrication for a story. Now, Gabriel Garcia Marquez said about Cook, it was unfair that she won the Pulitzer, but also unfair that she didn't win the Nobel Prize in Literature. Cook appeared in the Phil Donahue show in January 82 and said that the high-pressure environment of the Post had corrupted her judgment. She said that her sources had hinted at her about the existence of a boy such as Jimmy, but unable to find him, she eventually created a story about him to satisfy her editors. Now, Cook later uh, married a lawyer who subsequently became a diplomat. The couple moved to Paris in 85, living there for the next 10 years. However, their marriage eventually dissolved, and Cook said that the divorce left her impoverished. When she returned to the States, supporting herself with low-wage service jobs and financial support from her mother. In 96, she gave an interview uh, about the Jimmy's World episodes to GQ reporter Mike Sagar, a former Post colleague whom she had briefly dated during her time there. Cook and Sager said the film rights of the story to sold the uh, film rights to TriStar for $1.6 million, but the project never moved past the script stage. In 2016, she wrote in the Columbia Journalism View that Cook is living within the bow borders of the continental U.S. within a family setting and pursuing a career that does not primarily involve writing. So, uh, the truth will set you free, but the truth will put you in prison. All I know is this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've seen journalistic scandals through the years, including the you know the Hitler Diaries, but nothing like this. So if you like what you're doing here, we're our vintage uh, podcast about issues of the 1980s, let us know when to like, comment, subscribe, or share. Bye!